we're going to switch to uh, the indefinite integral. We've talked about the definite integral and today we're going to look at the indefinite integral and the process also that is known as anti-differentiation. Uh, as the name implies, anti-differentiation, we are going to basically be undoing differentiation or finding a derivative. In order to undo that, you need to know how you got there. So you need to know all these derivative rules that we learned in Calculus 1. So these are the ones you need to know. Again, assuming cn and a are constants and f and g are differentiable functions. This says the derivative of any constant is 0. The derivative with respect to x of x is 1. The graph of the function y equals x is just a line of slope 1. Remember the derivative is indeed the slope of the function at any point, and so the derivative of that function is 1. Uh, the derivative of x to the n in general, uh, this is the so-called power rule, I hope you remember. We bring the power down and then subtract 1 from the exponent. So the derivative of, say, x cubed is 3x squared. That should be one that's familiar to you. The derivative of e to the x, now this is not the power rule. Look at the difference there. In the power rule, the base is variable x. The exponent is fixed, n. For e to the x, now this is the exponent, natural exponential function. The base is fixed. E is a fixed number. It's about 2.718. And the exponent is now variable. But this is a rule you should remember is the easy rule, right? The derivative of e to the x is e to the x, the only, uh, one of the functions whose derivative is itself. So that means the slope of e to the x is at, at any point x is equal to the value of the function uh, e to the x. Um, linearity properties, the derivative of a constant times a function is the constant times the derivative, f prime denoting the derivative in this case of the differentiable function f. The uh, sum rule, right, the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. Same with a difference if I'm subtracting, it's just the difference of the derivatives. So that's easy, that comes from the linearity rules. Um, though it is not uh, true for products, right, we just can't take the derivative of a product and say take the derivative of f and multiply it times the derivative of g. No. Remember, product rule. It's the function f times the derivative of the function g plus the derivative of the function f times the function g. So you've got to remember that product rule. Very important. Uh, quotient rule. It's a little more complicated, right? You've got the, the numerator or top function f, the denominator or the bottom function g. It's the derivative of the top times the bottom minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all over the bottom function squared. The order you subtract here is important, so make sure you're clear on that. If you change the order, of, obviously you're going to get negative one times the actual derivative. Very, very important, the chain rule. This is, this is a composition. Notice this is not a product. It's not f of x times g of x. This is what? f of g of x. f of g of x. So g is the inner function, we say. f is the outer function. We're plugging the output to the function g into the function f. So we start with g, get the output, and then plug that into f and get the output. That's a composition. So this is chain rule. Derivative of f of g of x is the derivative of the outer function f evaluated at the inner function, very important, times the derivative of the inner function. And that's the chain rule. Very, very important. So you need to be able to do that. Uh, derivative of the trig functions. Derivative of sine of x is cosine of x. Derivative of cosine of x is negative sine of x. Derivative of tangent x is secant squared x. Derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared x. Derivative of secant x is secant x times tangent x. Derivative of cosecant x is negative cosecant x times cotangent x. You do need to know all six of those. The derivative of the inverse sine function, also sometimes written as arc sine, same thing. Arc sine of x, right? That derivative is this, 1 divided by the square root of 1 minus x squared. And that's an important one, as is the derivative of the inverse tangent function, 1 divided by x squared plus 1. There are derivatives for inverse cosine, inverse cotangent, inverse secant, inverse cosecant, but they don't come into play as much. I do want you to know these two. In fact, the derivative of the inverse cosine of x is just negative 1 divided by the square root of 1 minus x squared. The derivative of natural log of x is 1 divided by x. That's the natural log function. The 
uh, actually, let me jump over here. I put this one in last minute. The derivative of log base a of x, though, is 1 divided by x times the natural log of a. And notice it, ln of x means what? Natural log, right? Base e. So that would be log base e here. The a would be e. And the natural log of e is 1. And, and of course, that gives us this particular case. But if I'm taking the derivative of, say, log base 2 of x, that's 1 divided by x times the natural log of 2. And then we saw the uh, exponential function e to the x. Its derivative is e to the x. But in general, if I have like the derivative of 2 to the x or 3 to the x, I use this general exponential function rule. The derivative of a to the x is the natural log of a times a to the x. Okay, so if I'm taking the derivative of 2 to the x, it's the natural log of 2 times 2 to the x. Okay, so these are all the rules you must know in order to proceed. So please review these and be prepared. Um, to use them. So with that, let us talk about anti-differentiation and in a minute the indefinite integral. So a function capital F is called an antiderivative of the function little f on an interval if the derivative of capital F is little f. So you see we're going backwards. The previous example I was giving you the function and then asking for its derivative now I'm going to give you the derivative and ask for its function. So the act of finding an antiderivative is called antidifferentiation or integration. Now that's interesting because we've talked about the definite integral and we talked about integration as that process of evaluating the definite integral. We will show why these two are essentially the same um, soon. <laughs> Not in this video but in a, in a video to come. Okay, when we talk about the fundamental theorem of calculus. So capital F of x, right, this function, that is an antiderivative of the function 2x plus 7. Why is that? Because if I take the derivative of capital F, what do I get? What's the derivative of that? Power rule gives me 2x here. Derivative of 7x is just 7. And the derivative of 5 is 0. So I get 2x plus 7, right, which is the function little f. So that makes capital F uh, an antiderivative. Uh, notice I say an antiderivative. Uh, it is not the antiderivative because antiderivatives are not unique. So, for example, another antiderivative of 2x plus 7 is x squared plus 7x plus 10. You take the derivative of this function, I get 2x plus 7. It doesn't matter what this constant is, right? So, in general, we can always add a constant to an antiderivative and obtain another antiderivative. So, we say in the general or most general antiderivative of the function 2x plus 7 is x squared plus 7x plus c, where c is any constant. This constant is sometimes called the constant of integration. So any real number will work. And so interesting enough, when we talk about the derivative of a function, we get one particular function. When we talk about the antiderivative of a function, we get a whole family of functions. And they all differ by a constant. So that's the process that we're going to be looking at. So you can already begin to hopefully think about, we just talked about finding, giving, giving derivatives, uh, finding derivatives. Do that in reverse, right? So we're going to talk about that. Before we do so, let's talk about the indefinite integral. What's that? Well, it's basically the same thing as anti-differentiation. It is just notation for um, anti-differentiation. So, the indefinite integral is this, and it's called indefinite. You'll notice it looks like the definite integral, except what? We don't have lower, uh, uh, upper and lower limits, do we? There's no uh, from a to b here. It's just this integral sign, and then the integrand f of x, and then the function v of x. Well, this notation means find the antiderivative of little f. Right? So if I say the integral of little f right, with respect to x is capital F of x, right? plus c, right, because all the antiderivatives differ by this constant, then the derivative of capital F is little f. So in other words, capital F is the um, antiderivative, or we say that f of x plus c is the indefinite integral. So antiderivative and indefinite integral are used to refer to the same thing. They are interchangeable. Okay, But this is just a convenient notation to indicate we're finding the antiderivative of a function. Now you might say, why, why does that have to do with the definite integral where we were finding the area under a curve? How does that relate to finding an antiderivative? Well, again, fundamental theorem of calculus 
we will look at the connection there, and that will be the the, the, the wonderful thing about calculus. That is the, the the big the big story, if you will, the big um, finding that uh, made um, calculus so useful. Okay, so let's find the following uh, indefinite integrals. What is the uh, what would this be? Integral sine dx. The words the f. There's nothing there. If there's nothing there, what do we assume? We assume it's one. Okay. We assume the function is one. So that's the function little f. What's the antiderivative of one? Which function do I differentiate to get one? Obviously x. Right. The derivative of x is one. But then when we do this, we're going to do what? Plus what? This constant of integration. So it's not just x, but it could be x plus one. The derivative of x plus one is one. Or x minus five derivative is 1. x plus pi derivative is 1, and so on. What's the antiderivative of 2x? Hmm. Well, I think most of you got that down. If you think hard enough, it's got to be what? x squared plus, again, a constant. So we're undoing the power rule here, right? We're bringing the 2 back up. So power rule says bring the 2 down, subtract 1, I get 2x, right? The derivative of x squared is 2x. And here's the nice thing. If you know how to div find derivatives, which you should, if you say you know x squared is the antiderivative of 2x, you can check. Take the derivative of this thing, and it better be what you started with. So it's easy to check. I think we know what this is then. What's the antiderivative of 3x squared? x cubed plus c, right? Because the derivative of x cubed, bring the 3 down, subtract 1, I get 3x squared. What's the antiderivative of 4x cubed? Well, it's obviously x to the fourth. So you see a pattern developing there. Okay. I want to look at this pattern a little bit more different, uh, slight, well, slightly different. Um, we did the derivative, uh, antiderivative of 2x. What's the antiderivative of x? What's the antiderivative of x? We said, well, 2x was x squared, but if I say this is x squared, I'm not, it's not going to work, because if I bring this 2 down, I'll have 2x. There's only 1x here. So how are you going to make an adjustment to make this work? Most of you, I think, know what to do. We need to multiply by what? one half. All right? So that when I bring this two down two times a half, I will get one and then x to the first power. Don't forget our plus c. Okay? You can write it one half times x squared. That's the same as x squared divided by two. Okay? What about uh, x squared? What's that going to be? Well, same thing. You know, it's x cubed, but if I bring the 3 down, I'm going to have 3x squared. There's only 1x squared, so what do I need in front here to make that 1? 3 times 1 third will be 1. Right? Again, I can write this as x cubed divided by 3. Um, x cubed, then, you see a pattern developing here? 1 fourth x to the fourth plus c. And then here, x to the fifth divided by 5 plus c. So in general, as long as n is not equal to negative 1, find the indefinite integral of x to the n. Well, look at the pattern we've developed here. If it's x to the first power, it's x squared divided by 2. x to the second power, x cubed divided by 3. Uh, to the third power, x to the fourth divided by 4. Uh, to the fourth power, x to the fifth divided by 5. So the power is always one more. Right? How do I do one more than n? Uh, 1 more than n is n plus 1 divided by, notice the same power, n plus 1, the same number, and then don't forget our plus c. This is basically the general power rule uh, when we talk about antiderivatives going in the other direction. Now you will notice we said n cannot be negative 1, and you clearly see why. If n were negative 1, we'd have division by 0. So we'll, I think some of you already know what is the case for the antiderivative when n is negative 1, but we'll look at that um, shortly. Okay, so now that we have this rule, let's find some antiderivatives here. x to the 20th then by the rule is what? x to the 20 plus 1, or 21st power, divided by 21. Let's see, there's the antiderivative. x to the 5 third power, we, n can be any a number, even a fractional number. Uh, what do we have? x to the 5 thirds plus 1, what's 5 thirds plus 1? 5 thirds plus 3 thirds, which is 8 thirds, divided by 8 thirds. Now, this is fine as an answer, but it's not very nice. I would like to rewrite this. Division by 8 thirds is the same as what? Multiplying by what? The reciprocal, 3 eighths. Right. 
And again, notice we can check our work. If you know, we think we made a mistake, as it gets more challenging, we'll often want to do this. Find the derivative of this thing, right? 3 eighths is a constant multiple pulled out. Bring the 8 thirds down. 3 eighths times 8 thirds is what? 1 x to the what? Subtract 1. 3 thirds subtract from 8 thirds is 5 thirds. And I get back to this original. Okay. Now, be careful here, right? Is this become 1 over uh, what? Antiderivative x cubed is going to be what? 1 fourth x to the fourth? Is this 1 divided by 1 fourth x to the fourth? No. The antiderivative has to be x to a power. This is 1 divided by x to a power. But we can write it as x to a power, right? What is the correct way to write 1 divided by x cubed? It's x to what power? I hope you're saying negative 3. Yeah, you have to know what negative exponents mean. Those mean reciprocals, right? x cubed to the negative 1 power is 1 divided by x cubed, right? Negative 1 power means reciprocal. Now it's in the form because negative 3 is the exponent. Be careful here. When I add 1 to negative 3, add 1 to negative 3, what do I get? Negative 3 plus 1 is negative 2, not negative 4, divided by negative 2. And now what I would like to do, though, is not leave my answer with a negative exponent. The original problem we had did not have a negative exponent. And we needed to do that in order to make use of the power rule. And now we want to rewrite this. And so x to the negative 2 is 1 divided by x squared. So it's negative 1 half times 1 divided by x squared. We get negative 1 divided by 2x squared plus a constant. And there is our antiderivative. What about the square root of x? You say, square root of x, that's, that's not a power. Well, actually it is. I hope you know what square root of x is. x to what power? It's to the 1 half power. Right? Oops, sorry, up here I wrote plus c. This should be dx. Pardon my incorrect notation there. It should not be plus c dx, there's plus c, absolute dx, up until, right, notice once we find the antiderivative, that dx and that integral sign just disappear, right? This is just saying, it's like, you know, there's like a parenthesis in here, it says find the integral of whatever the function is with respect to x, that's what that dx means. Okay, so until you find the antiderivative, you've got it set up this way, but once you find the antiderivative, that dx is gone, the integral sign is gone, and you just have the antiderivative, and don't forget your plus c. So now I can do this one. The power is 1 half, so by the power rule, I add 1 to a half. 1 half plus 1 is 3 halves, divided by 3 halves, plus c. Again, I'll do what I did a minute ago. Dividing by 3 halves is the same as multiplying by 2 thirds. So here's the antiderivative of the square root of x. Now, you know, this, of course, can be written as what? x to the 3 halves powers is x cubed square root, or you can write it as the square root of x cubed either way. I typically will leave it just in fractional form. The only time I'm going to convert usually a fractional form is something like you know x to the 1 half, I'll usually write a square root of x. But I usually don't rewrite it in either of these forms. Now, if you need to evaluate the antiderivative at some value of x, you may want to put it in one of these forms. It just makes it easier to understand what's going on there. Okay. okay, so we've looked at several, uh, mainly the power rule, uh, but we have a lot more to look at, and so in the next video we will begin to look at those other antiderivatives.